Welcome everybody to today's session. And uh, we have two speakers today. We'll start with uh, Jian Zhu. Jian Zhu is uh, currently an Associate Director of Biostatistics at Servier Pharmaceuticals. He obtained his PhD in biostatistics from University of Michigan and Harbor, and worked at the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center and Takeda Pharmaceuticals prior to joining Servier. His drug development experience includes leading global oncology programs in hematologic uh, malignancy and the solid tumors, leading statistical innovation working groups, and serving as a statistical consultant um, in multiple therapeutic areas. Our second speaker is Eric Barron. He is, he is a fourth year PhD student in statistics at the University of Connecticut. He has worked as a research assistant with the Servier Pharmaceuticals since January 2020. His research interests are Bayesian modeling, adaptive Bayesian clinical trial designs, methods for incorporating real-world evidence, and meta-analysis methods. So without further ado, let's hear from the speakers. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, would you like to start? Eric, could uh, you share your slide? Yep. Okay. That's good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Rita, and thank you so much for the DIA uh, KLO series for um, having us here today. Um, I'm very happy that um, uh, I will be uh, presenting um, a new framework or extended framework on Bayesian divided and conquered propensity score based approach for leveraging uh, real world data. And I'm very happy um, that um, I get to work with Eric Barron and uh, um, his advisor, uh, Professor Ming Hui Chen. Um, and today um, I will start the presentation um, by describing um, the general framework and then Eric will actually cover uh, more details, especially regarding the simulations. So Eric, can you go to the next slide, please? So before I start, I, I uh, want to actually acknowledge the collaboration between um, Servier and the uh, University of Connecticut, the stats uh, department, as we are committed to developing uh, new and innovative clinical trial designs and the statistical methodologies. And for this presentation, we will focus on the work, uh, including in a paper we recently published in JBS. And um, we are aware that there are lots of recent development in this area. And today we really hope to share the findings that we identify, as well as to provide some cautionary suggestions regarding certain caveats. And we particularly um, would like to uh, um, uh, you know, uh, mentioned the 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 uh, previous groups, um, their work in this area, and we very much look forward to working with many uh, talented statisticians in our community in the future. Uh, with that being said, um, I will quickly go through the outlines of the presentation today. Eric, uh, next slide, please. So, um, as you may see on the screen, that um, the presentation will cover four major sections. And um, I will provide a little bit background uh, for this presentation and, and especially the assumption and the scope and uh, describe the certain uh, type of metho methodologies. And I will also review um, and, 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 and uh, explore the general framework. So um, after that, um, Eric will discuss the methodologies um, in detail and also share some uh, findings uh, based on simulations. And he will also conclude a talk with some um, you know, main takeaway messages. Next slide, please. And next. OK, so um, as we are all aware, right now are uh, utilizing real world data or um, external data uh, in, in nature, including the historical clinical trial data in, to supplement the clinical trial data, uh, either in design and analysis is particularly uh, of interest nowadays. And they are very relevant in rare diseases, right? And when I say rare diseases, it also includes certain oncology 
uh, areas because nowadays when you have very certain specific uh, mutations, the population tend to be very small and it's extremely uh, difficult to identify these patients and let alone enrolling uh, these patients in the traditional uh, RCT settings. And there are lots of uh, papers um, published uh, in the literature. You know, these methods actually um, include both frequentist and Bayesian approaches, right? And recently we also uh, observed uh, many uh, regulatory guidances from, you know, all major agencies across the world in the recent years. And I think there are also collaborations between these regulatory agencies and academia and industry to uh, draft different kind of uh, guidance on how to implement um, the RWT in the uh, clinical developments. Um, and this concept, you know, using the RWD is not new, right? It previously, I think it has been uh, frequently used in post-marketing setting, you know, to kind of um, use the uh, real-world data to generate evidence. But I think um, uh, more and more uh, we have seen, uh, you know, implementation of such approaches in clinical trials. And we have seen uh, several successful implementation in the, uh, you know, various case studies including the synthetic control arm, hybrid control arm designs. Um, so given the vast uh, range of uh, different kind of topics, uh, today we really want to focus on one uh, particular uh, scenario, which is how to leverage uh, real world data to estimate a certain parameter of interest. Uh, and, and this is actually motivated by a study that uh, faced extremely uh, extreme difficulty in enrolling a large sample size in a very small uh, patient population and indication. So the parameter of interest could be, you know, treatment effect, for example, what is the average uh, uh, change in the cognitive score, right? Or a motor score or in oncology, could it be the uh, response rate, um, et cetera. And we, we uh, focus the uh, uh, presentation in single arm trials, but certainly, uh, you know, in the future, this can be extended to uh, randomized controlled trials as well. Next, please. And as I mentioned that, you know, this problem is not new, right? So um, how, and, and, and also the utilization of external data be it real world data or historical control data. Um, uh, there are many actually uh, 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 available methods out there already. You know, one such solution is the Bayesian borrowing and especially Bayesian dynamic borrowing, right? Which have been proposed and implemented for quite a while already. And when the data are not exactly consistent between, you know, data sources, the dynamic borrowing offers the um, you know uh, advantage that the larger the difference and the, the less information that we should borrow from the external data, right? However, the data inconsistency or discrepancy between the data sources could uh, be due to various reasons, right? So, for example, the study uh, conduct or design could be different. They might actually use the different inclusion exclusion criteria. And uh, the supportive care may be different. And you may actually have different baseline characteristics. For example, pa patients may be coming from different age groups where they have different kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, disease characteristics, right? And there, there could be more uh, reasons um, that we are not even aware of. And I know that there's some uh, exciting development even in actually, uh, you know, accounting for these unmeasured uh, uh, reasons or, or um, you know, inclusion criteria. Now, the common methods um, uh, from the Bayesian framework, including, uh, you know, I, I, we just listed a few here, um, including the power prior, the commensurate power prior, and meta analytic predictive prior approach, and most recently also the elastic prior. Um, they may not necessarily, you know, focus on the aggregated data, but I think in the past, a lot of them were actually applied 
um, to aggregate data, especially the uh, you know summaries of data from literature, from papers, probably due to the lack of individual patient data, right, in the earlier years. Uh, next, please. But recently, I think, um, I, especially I think in, during the past 10 years, right, um, we have seen many uh, uh, databases, either public or commercial databases, which can offer um, you know, a uh, wide range of individual patient level data. And these data, they not only offer the outcome and then they also provide a very rich, uh, you know, uh, set of patient level baseline characteristics and also the important prognostic factors. And with these individual patient level data, right, the, I, I, I think there's still uh, a, a, you know, in the past, a popular trend to continue using the previous methods and, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to kind of, for example, directly apply the Bayesian dynamic borrowing. However, the individual patient level data does allow additional room for improvement, right? In the frequentist framework, for example, uh, we have seen a lot of the uh, development, uh, you know, from uh, previously, I, I think it's from the um, observational studies, all these methods, including the uh, propensity score matching, propensity uh, weighting, or stratification, to be uh, utilized to balance, you know, the uh, baseline covariance and then the prognostic factors, right? And if all these inconsistency can be actually explained by these, uh, you know, by the imbalance in the baseline co characteristics, then that would be great. Is. However, if the uh, you know existing baseline covariates can only partially explain some of these inconsistency, then there is this intuitive thought, right? You can actually separate the inconsistency into two parts, right? One part is due to the imbalanced covariance, and the other part may be due to other factors, which you know can be caused by some. Uh, uh, covariates that are not even uh, measured, or there could be some temporary effect that, you know, uh, if you borrow uh, certain data from, uh, like, say, five years ago, there could be, um, you know, underlying change in the in the supporting supportive care, and therefore, even if you balance the covariates based on characteristics, there still could be inconsistency between the, you know, external data and the trial data. Right. So the intuitive thought is that if you can actually break the inconsistency into two parts, then you basically apply the corresponding, more appropriate methods to handle each type of uh, inconsistency. Right. And we break them in on more granular levels and use the best tool to handle each type. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we want to mention that, uh, you know, there are all, already some existing methods to actually handle and to actually adopt this, uh, you know, approach. And uh, one at all 2019, I think it's first uh, paper to consider this approach to combine the propensity score method and uh, with the power prior. Uh, later on, uh, Liu et al. Um, extended this to the meta-analytic uh, uh, prior approach and you know if you have actually multiple external data sources right and in this talk we want to focus on the case that um, there is only one external data source and we want to show how we can generalize the framework and uh, share more uh, learnings from our um, collaborations that being said uh, next Eric uh, I will actually give a high level description of the extended framework and um, the objective uh, for us to explore the uh, framework is uh, listed here. Um, first of all, we actually, uh, for demonstration purpose, uh, we only focus on the normal endpoint, but obviously, you know, this work can be extended to binary or even time to event uh, endpoints. And we actually proposed various 
um, additional propensity score stratified model uh, methods, and and we compared them to their corresponding non-stratified non counterparts. Um, uh, the additional methods include the, an extension of the uh, propensity score power prior approach. Um, uh, appropriately accounting for different kind of uh, tuning parameters to control the amount of information to be borrowed. And also we will discuss how we can combine the inference from different strata using different ways. And another um, prior uh, we consider is the mixture prior approach. And the last one is the double hierarchical prior approach. And we want to emphasize that in our framework, we properly consider the nuances uh, of parameters in the Bayesian framework. Next. So um, for the next few slides, I'm going to quickly just go through this divide and conquer approach. And as many of you are already familiar with um, the propensity score stratification piece is actually relatively uh, straightforward. So once you have the control, I'm sorry, once you have the tri arm data uh, from the current trial, and then you have a external data source, uh, be it real world data or um, historical control data, a uh, historical trial data, um, we will actually identify the important baseline characteristics and prognostic factors, right? And then we fit a propensity score model to um, estimate the probability um, of, of each um, patient being included in the two data sources. And once you have the estimated uh, propensity score, then um, next, please. The idea is that you can create multiple strata, right, with thresholds based on quantiles of the trial uh, propensity scores. And uh, here we follow, um, you know, uh, what is commonly used in the literature as well is that uh, we create five strata uh, based on the quantiles of the uh, propensity scores uh, in the trial arm. And therefore, after we create these five strata, then we can actually um, uh, balance um, the covariance within each strata better, right? Other uh, compared to the non-stratified version. Uh, next slide, please. And then, you know, after we have these five strata, we then allocate the external patients from the other data source into the corresponding strata defined by, you know, um, the a range of uh, propensity scores. Next. Now, what do we expect to see after the stratification, right? Or at least the, what, what's the goal of, and, and what's the reason to do this? The reason is uh, that uh, we aim to balance the prognostic factors. And at least for those included in the propensity score model, right? This is another, uh, different issue is that what if you miss some of the important recognized factors, but at least for the uh, factors included in the propensity score, we hope to achieve a better balance compared to the non-stratified version, right? And here, um, we actually, based on some uh, simulation, um, we uh, have some illustrative example to see what it, what, what is the propensity score distribution and outcome distribution after stratification? So on the left side, um, this is actually a plot for the propensity scores. And the light, uh, it's the greenish is for the trial arm and the red one is for the external arm. And after the propensity score stratification, you can see that the propensity scores are much closer across the two data sources within each stratum, right? So that indeed achieves the goal. And on the right side, it's the impact on the outcome distribution. And on, on, um, within each stratum, uh, you can see that the outcome distribution are also much closer. However, they do not exactly match. There is still 
uh, small imbalance within certain strata, especially you know, for the strata with the low propensity scores. And this is also because the way that we group the propensity scores according to the quantiles, right? So next, please. Think within each stratum, then we can ap apply the prior to actually estimate the stratum specific parameter of interest and still accounting for the, uh, you know, um, maybe we can call it the residual heter heterogeneity among the strata, right? And I want to remind uh, us that the goal is to actually estimate the overall parameter of interest, be it uh, response rate or the average treatment effect size uh, for the target trial. So once the, uh, once the external group um, is, is matched to the current trial, ultimately, um, you know, they all will be used to serve the purpose to actually improve the estimation of the trial arm um, parameter of interest. Um, next, I think I'm going to um, stop here after the, oops. Eric, can sure, you I the yeah, I just had to make sure I wasn't on mute. Okay. okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish this slide and then Eric, you, uh, you, you can actually describe the details um, of in, the, uh, in the next the slides. Yeah, so I, want to mention one thing is that this, uh, by following this approach, there is a possibility that um, some of the external uh, group patients or subjects, their propensity score is actually outside the range of the propensity score uh, from the current trial arm. Therefore, these patients will be actually excluded in the analysis. Um, and for some strata, or certain stratum, um, the sample size for each group um, may not be sufficiently large enough for the external data. For the for the trial data, uh, for the trial group, it's guaranteed, right? For example, if you're if we are looking at a five strata, and then basically the sample size in the current trial arm is basically divided into five parts. However, for the external uh, data source it's not guaranteed to have sufficiently large number of patients. In this case, um, if the sample size is really too small, then we will not leverage any information from the external arm, and we will then use the non-informative uh, prior instead. Okay. Eric, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, so just a quick setting recap. So um, as you mentioned, we have a current group, and we have an external group. So just for notation purposes, uh, we assume as follows, um, we have response for um, NC individuals um, and a vector of covariates, um, which doesn't include an intercept as well for the um, NC individuals. And similarly, we denote DC as um, the data source um, that, that encompasses both the responses and the um, vector of covariates for each observation. Um, and then similarly, we define this as well for the external group as follows, um, really as far as notation goes, just the difference is E for external and then C for our current group. Then as Gian mentioned, we are working in a continuous framework. Um, so at least for um, our paper in this presentation, um, we assume a normal continuous endpoint. So here we assume um, the observations, all the observations follow normal distribution with parameter um, theta C and variance C C squared. Um, our, just a reminder, so theta C is our true mean effect in the current group and our main parameter of interest. And then um, YEJ follows also normal distribution um, with mean theta E and variance sigma E squared. So to generalize the framework and just to clarify our model's assumptions, uh, we compute a sample mean and a sample variance within each stratum, so the kth stratum. Um, so here, the index is just um, denotes the um, over the observations within that specific data source within. So, for example, for the current um, current group in the kth stratum. 
Then after computing the sample mean and sample variance, um, this is what formulates our um, likelihood once we end up invasion inference. But here, for the case stratum, what we assume under normality setting um, that the sample mean and sample variance are independent. So we assume, this is what our model assumes, is that our, um, within each of the K stratum that um, the sample mean follows a normal distribution. And then also, um, as we would in the general normal framework, um, have um, the sample variance follow transformed um, gamma distribution here. Um, then what's different from our approach is um, previous approaches um, estimated um, the population variance within the kth stratum um, using the sample standard deviation. So we um, generalized this and extend it and actually put a prior on it and estimate it in a fully Bayesian matter. So our first approach is the double hierarchical approach. So um, probably easier to read this from the bottom to the top, but here we have five stratum, um, at least for this picture. Then within every stratum, once we have the parentheses square certification, um, we have two sources of data within every um, stratum. We have um, observations for both the current um, treatment group and the external group. So for each stratum, one to five. Then within every stratum, uh, we assume um, from the previous slide that um, they follow normal distribution with mean as false, those beta CK um, and beta EK. Then um, our first, um, then we, in a hierarchical um, framework, we then assume that um, beta C1 and beta E1 both follow normal distributions with mean um, mu k and um, variance um, tau k squared for each of the k stratum. And then um, um, in a hierarchical framework, um, then set priors for an overall mean parameter and precision. To go more into the details, um, and also just for ease of exposition, um, we assume that within every of the k stratum, um, that the the number of observations is greater than or equal to two, just so we can calculate a sample variance. Otherwise, um, as Gian mentioned, we would um, use a non-informed prior there. So in the first stage in the kth stratum, we assume both um, stratum-specific um, prior variance mean for the current group in the kth stratum. Excuse me. Um, and um, beta EK both follow normal distributions with um, the same mean and same variance mu K and tau K. Then in the second stage, what we do is one, we assume mu K is our, we could think of it as our stratum specific mean, um, follows the normal distribution with um, an overall mean mu and overall um, variance of phi square. And then tau K square, we set as we have a prior with truncated normal. Um, here, these parameters are fixed constants that we explore um, through sensitivity analysis, but here beta one to beta four um, depict the um, mean variance, uh, min and maximum. And um, good question would be, why not use something more traditional like an inverse gamma distribution or a gamma distribution? Um, here, truncated normal is really used um, just for computational, uh, computational efficiency and for convergence. Um, then um, the overall mean follows um, non-informative prior as follows. Um, kappa naught is just a um, scalar. And then um, set a gamma um, prior for, in this case, um, one over phi square. Then um, sensitivity analysis is done on these constants as well, but we set um, both sigma CK square and sigma EK square. So the stratum specific population variance for each group um, as non-informative inverse gamma priors as follows. So for K equals one, 2K. So this is um, at least our first approach to a hierarchical approach where we dynamically borrow from each, um, from the external data from within each of the K stratum. So to now introduce our second approach, we use the mixture prior on um, here. Um, so with, I'll start from here, but here we have K stratum once again, in this case, five stratum. So we start from the top, we use, um, we use the RWD or in, within every of the K stratum, we use the observations um, to then formulate a prior, um, the stars for our um, first mixture prior um, based for our stratum specific parameter of interest, which is data CK. Then we use, once we build this prior based off of the historical data, we then um, have our likelihood from the current data then we do um, calculate our posterior distribution within the kth stratum, and then we'll discuss how we actually combine these parameters. Um, 
so for our star, at least in this mixture prior approach, what we're doing is we're using um, the external data here. Uh, gamma K is just a mixing weight. Um, and we set this as our prior for theta CK within every, within every stratum. Here, what the uh, mixture prior, how it works is it's using a mixing parameter gamma K, which um, is a mix between uh, a mixture prior between one, a um, informative prior. Here, this is just the posterior distribution of theta CK given um, the external data, which at least in this case and under our setting um, will just be a normal distribution. And then here, this is a non-informative um, flat prior. And then we'll discuss the formulation of gamma K as well. So within of the K stratum, we assume that theta EK and equals theta CK. Just to recap, um, those are the population means of the response within the K stratum, within the external group and the current group. We then use um, the sample mean um, within, every, within every of the K stratum uh, to construct our mixture prior for theta CK as follows from some of the same formulation from the previous slide. Here, the mixture weights between zero and one, and we set the non-informative density as follows. Then our mixing parameter is as false for k equals one to k. We use it the here. Um, this is the ratio of sample sizes. So NCK would be the sample size of the current group in the kth stratum, and EK is the sample size of the external group in the kth stratum, multiplied by a scalar in the denominator. And this is also for sensitivity. Uh, this is a constant selected after doing sensitivity analysis. And here, um, at least for when using the mixture prior, we can imagine that we have a lot more external observations than um, current group observations. Then once again, we use, um, going back to our framework is we are um, setting non-informative priors for sigma CK square and sigma EK square for each of the case stratum. Then the third approach, so recap was we had our double hierarchical approach uh, which dynamically borrows. We had our mixture prior, which uses um, a mixing um, prior with the mixing weight based off of the ratio of sample sizes. And now we use the power prior, which is similar to um, the one that's all 2019 um, prior. And we'll discuss the differences in, in a sec. Um, the same, same steps are taken. So first we use the external group responses. Um, we use star for the prior. We formulate our prior for the using our historical data. And then once we have our likelihood, then we do posterior inference then within each of the case stratum. How the power prior works um, is we use, this is the likelihood for um, the external data. We then discount our external data with the formulation of a discounting parameter alpha K for each of the case stratum. And then um, the standard formulation is to use a non-informative prior and that's what we do here as well. And then we'll discuss the formulation. And just once again, within each of the case stratum, we have both sources of data. We have both external data and current data. So now, once again, we assume theta EK equals theta CK, the power prior formulated as follows. Here, um, the discounting parameter is between zero and one, and we use a non-informative prior um, as follows. So where our approach is different is, Previous approach, Wang et al. 2019, they um, formulate alpha K based off of the overlap of, it's a formulation based off of the overlap of the propensity score densities. Um, what we do is as follows. Um, this is an extension that's, so alpha K uh, is formulated as follows. And we'll describe this um, in a moment. The formulation, the actual setup of the formulation comes from um, an extension of a um, Chen Ibrahim 2006 paper. In this paper, what they do is they also under a continuous endpoint, um, they formulate a relationship between the power prior and a hierarchical prior, very similar to our approach. And then under, under um, certain conditions in the formulation, um, their, um, the formulation for the discounting parameter is as follows. Um, here, finite K should, from their formulation, uh, takes into account the discrepancy between the external data and the current data. NEK being our sample size of the external group in the kth stratum and the sample variance um, within the external group in the kth stratum plus one. Then um, Jing et al. 2020 um, from, from GN's part, um, this is the elastic prior paper. And here, um, an interesting observation is that they, and a good idea is to use the um, difference in responses 
um, when you're looking at the Gates drawdown to discount data based on the actual difference in responses. So maybe not necessarily um, based off of the propensity score. Here, um, this approach is used in the formulation of phi naught k. Here, as follows, we use max y bar ck minus y bar ek square times a scalar, which is also um, estimated um, through sensitivity analysis, times um, the sample variance in the external group in the case stratum. Um, the reason for the difference is to want to avoid overborrowing. We expect that under PS stratification, that once the covariates are um, more similar, that the responses should also be more similar. So just to avoid overborrowing, that's why we have this max argument. The reason for the square is just to at least keep the units consistent with our um, sample variance um, square. And also um, with the maximum, we at least have um, we at least have control over how much to borrow to avoid overborrowing. Um, and then once again, we use um, non-informative priors for sigma square CK and sigma EK square. So then now we discussed all the divide part. This is um, the conquer part. So our main goal is to estimate theta C, which is our overall treatment effect. Um, within every of the stratum, we have a stratum specific treatment of treatment effect. So theta C1 to theta CK. So what we do is we use draws from the posterior distribution of theta C. Um, and these are made by using the draws from the posterior distributions of the stratum specific parameters. And this step um, is not new. Previous approaches have done this where they take all these stratum specific parameters and they combine them using a weighted average as follows. So now to recap, we discussed the double hierarchical approach. We discussed the mixture prior approach and we discussed the power prior approach. So now we'll look into um, simulations and some case examples. So the objectives of our simulation are one, to examine the performance of the proposed methods when there's imbalance in the current and external groups. And what we mean by imbalance in the current external groups, at least for here, we imply the difference in the means of the baseline char characteristics. Two, examine what effect what effect of the sample size plays in terms of the trial group and the external group. Then we do a pairwise comparison of stratified and non-stratified approaches, and then also investigate advantages of using different combining weights. Combining weights being the weights we put on the stratified parameters when we do that weighted average procedure. So uh, within the simulation setting, we simulate our covariates from both the current group and external group using a multivariate normal distribution with dimension D. Um, XCI is just a vector, multivariate normal distribution with means MC and for the external group, um, ME. And then covariance variance matrix, uh, sigma C and sigma E for each of the observations. We assume that um, the covariates within all, um, the covariates, um, the baseline covariates for each observation are independent. So we just set these as just an identity matrix. Um, then we generate the outcome using a linear regression framework. Um, here um, as follows. Then we assume um, epsilon i follows i to normal um, zero a to c square and um, epsilon j um, normal zero with a to e square. And we define this here just because we will tune these um, in our simulation study. So normal covariates and um, normal linear regression model. So now um, our select scenarios, we have three scenarios we'd like to present today. So we explore scenarios with three covariates. So D being three, K equals five, the number of stratum. Um, the reason for using five stratum, it's, so there was a paper um, within the RCT um, setting. So two arms where um, so another Wong, uh, another paper called Wong, it's all 2021. Um, there in this, um, in their RCT framework, what they do is they borrow historical observations just for the control group, and then they have a separate treatment group, and then they take a treatment difference. So at least there, they uh, do sensitivity analysis on the number of stratum. We in this, in this, in these slides in this paper did not, um, and that will be, should be explored. Um, the reason for K equals five was this is a general recommendation from Rosenbaum 1984, where they, at least in the frequentist framework, suggest that um, five stratum will at least help alleviate a percentage of bias. Then um, we set our intercept to be zero, uh, we set all the regression coefficients to be one. Um, and then our mean in our external group, this is where we induce our covariate imbalance as 0.511 for each of the covariates and um, MC 1, 1.2, 1.25. Um, and different degrees of imbalance were also explored. 
Um, here, the cutoffs are defined as follows. Here, what we're doing is, so there's no consensus on when or at what percentile you should do, um, should formulate the stratum. So here, um, at least for simplicity, uh, we're just doing it based off of the quintiles. So now we have um, three scenarios. So this describes the scenario. Theta true is our true, um, our true parameter of interest. Um, here, what this really is, um, is just um, the sum of, excuse me, the sum of um, the mean vector, just because our regression coefficients are one and our intercept is zero. Um, in our first scenario, we set the sample size for the current group to 100. Any star is the number of observations before trimming, so 1,000. This NE is a average on, so over our, our number of replicates, um, on average, how many observations are left after the trimming step. Um, just to recap, the trimming step is we remove any observations that are outside of the propensity score of the current group. And then um, in our first scenario, we set A to E squared, the conditional variance of the response given the covariance to one. The second, so this we call the inbound with small variance. In our second scenario, what we do is we do an inbound with larger variance. Um, so same, same as scenario one, except we increase the conditional variance um, of the response given the covariance to three to see um, what role the actual variation in the response plays on our actual inference and our results. Then three, once again, we have inbounds with double the sample size. This is a repeat of scenario one with double the sample size in the current group and double the sample size in the external group. And on average, we have 1,157 uh, external group patients after um, the trimming step. So just to recap, one, um, in the first one, we have um, imbalance. In the second one, we have larger variance with the same imbalance. And then in the third case, we um, have the same variance as scenario one, but just double the sample size. And I'll um, go back to the slide, um, reference the slide as well as we proceed. So in our combining step, um, we do sensitivity analysis on what the weights should actually be. Um, previously, a, at least in the Wong et al. 2019 paper, they recommend using one over K, which is, um, K being a number of stratum, so just in, in our case, it would just be our first scenario, which is just point two across. Then, and we'll explain why we do this in, um, in a few slides, but here, as we go from weight scenario one to five, what we notice is we put more and more weight on the third stratum. So for example, in our um, second weight, we do point one, point two, point four, point two, point one. And as we see, as we go from weight one to weight five, we're putting more and more weight on the middle stratum, in this case, the third stratum. We have a weight 4, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0.05. So to recap, from weight 1 to um, 1 is the original approach. And then from 1 to 5, we're putting more weight on the middle stratum. So now um, we use the following metrics to evaluate um, our methods. So bias, RMSC, coverage probability, sample deviation, simulation, standard error. Um, we use 1,000 replicates of the data for each scenario. Just for more detail, um, we're using an MC sample of 10,000 iterations and burn-in of 1,000. Theta hat R is our um, posterior mean in the R replicate minus the true um, mean. So this is our um, how we define our bias. Um, then RMSC here, um, same notation again. Then um, for coverage probability, what we use, um, we def formulate 95% HPD intervals. And how these intervals are made is, um, once we have the stratum specific draws, we then take a take a weighted average as the procedure states um, to then formulate draws of the overall parameter of interest, which is just theta C. Then we formulate the 95% HPD, HPD interval and then count the number of times that the true parameter is in the interval and take the average. Then sample standard deviation as follows. Here, um, theta RM denotes the M iteration within the Rth replicate. Then um, we also here just for um, completeness, we define the simulation standard error. Here um, we can think of theta hat r is just the posterior mean and the r replicate. And here we can think of is just the standard deviation of the posterior mean over the r replicates. So now. Um, our first scenario um, is one and two. To recap, that was an imbalance with small variance and imbalance with large variance. 
Um, to read um, this, we have four plots here. The first row is um, scenario ones, bias and RMSC. So bias being on, and the first column is bias and the second column is RMSC. And the second row is um, scenario two. So I'll start from the top here. The y-axis is bias, um, y-axis here is RMSC. And our approaches from left to right here in pink, um, pink or red, we have the non-stratified approach. Then W1 was just the direct average. And from W1 to W5, um, we put more and more weight on the third stratum. So starting from scenario one, what we notice is that the direct average um, does have smaller bias than the non-stratified approach. And what we notice is, and this is why we did the sensitivity analysis with the different combining weights, what we notice is that as we put, at least with the hierarchical approach, as we put more and more weight on the third stratum, we, um, uh, our bias slightly decreases. And this is more, um, and we see this more in scenario two. Um, we see that the bias also um, tends to slightly decrease from as we put more and more weight on the um, third stratum. Our penalty though, our RMSC is, um, in both scenarios, our RMSC is smaller with direct average. Uh, but our penalty of this decrease, a uh, slight decrease in bias is our um, RMSC increases. So to recap, um, bias is lower here in scenario one. We explore scenario two, it's an imbalance with larger variance to see um, whether increased variation in the response and how that um, influences our inference and our um, model's results. And then once again, pink was non-stratified approach. And then weight one to weight five was more and more weight on the fifth stratum. Um, once there's questions, we can also go back to this slide. Then for first row is scenario one, and then second row is scenario two. Um, and our first, um, then our first column is coverage probability. And then our second column is a plot where pink denotes standard deviation and blue denotes standard error. So what we notice is that the non-stratified approach in both scenarios has um, good coverage. At least the screen denotes the, um, the y-axis is coverage probability in the first column. Um, the green is our nominal HPD level, which was 95. And then what we notice is that our stratified approach um, doesn't have doesn't, its coverage is not where um, the nominal should be. So we have an under coverage um, problem here. Um, then when we inspect the standard deviation standard error, we see that our standard error, at least within our stratified approach is consistently smaller than our standard error. So um, what, what, what this tells us is that when we're using these propensity score Bayesian certification methods, that there's a underestimation of our variance, um, the estimated variance of our combined parameter of interest. Um, so this is at least, Next steps we would like to take to then how to properly estimate this combined parameter of interest. And then we see that also when there's more variation in the second scenario, where there's inbounds with larger variance, um, in fact, more variation causes our coverage to increase. Still, um, the under coverage problems persist and our standard deviation is still smaller than our standard error. Um, thus, there needs to be, um, thus this, this, this issue needs to be handled and um, we need to fix the underestimation of variance within this framework and within propensity score Bayesian gratification methods. Then the mixture approach. Um, so first row is scenario one, um, second row is scenario two. So already covered the hierarchical approach. Now we're on the mixture prior approach. Um, here um, in scenario one, we have bias, um, RMSC from the first scenario and then bias, um, from scenario two and RMC from scenario two. And then what we notice is that at least in the mixture prior approach, the bias is not reduced. Um, and the same trend for putting more weights on the middle stratum um, is not, um, it does decrease bias here. And the penalty is we, um, our RMC tends to increase in both scenarios. Um, here, at least the mixture, um, at least caution when using the mixture prior approach is um, our bias is not, we'd like it to be lower than the non-stratified approach. But really the reason here um, that the bias is smaller, um, as Gian mentioned, there's two sources of bias. One, um, when you're, one, the stratification bias, there's, because we're essentially, um, when we stratify, uh, we, um, essentially when we stratify, there is within stratum bias when we're actually combining 
um, combining the parameters of interest. Um, so that's one reason for stratification bias. Then two, the bias of course comes from when we borrow historical data. So at least here on our mixture prior approach, our um, mixing parameter was based off of a ratio of sample sizes. So here, um, the non-stratified approach does not borrow, non-stratified or only one stratum um, analogous there. Um, but the non-stratified approach just doesn't borrow as much historical data. And that's why the bias we see is lower. And then as mentioned before, um, as, as the weight, um, as we put more and more weight on the third stratum, our um, bias tends to um, decrease and the penalty more arm, higher arm received. Then um, once again, the first row is scenario one's coverage probability, standard deviation, standard error, pink being the non, excuse me, pink being the non-stratified approach. Um, and then here, um, this being pink being the standard deviation and blue being the standard error. And then once again, in the mixture prior approach, and this is what we'll see with the power prior as well, is this underestimation of the variance of our combined parameter of interest, that our coverage um, is not where, of course, where we'd like it to be, and um, we'd like to fix it to be, um, or better estimate this variance to have higher coverage in terms of, um, in proximity towards the nominal HPD level. And this is what we see um, consistently. Similarly with the power prior approach, um, here, once again, as we go from weight one to weight five, we do not see the same trend for um, decreasing bias as we put more and more weight on the third stratum. So first row is bias and RMC in scenario one, and then second row is bias and RMC in scenario two. Um, the approaches from NS um, non-stratified to weight five. So here, once again, um, similar to the mixing parameter, um, we want to avoid overborrowing based on the difference in the sample means. Um, once we stratify, we anticipate that the sample means are more, that's what we observe as well as that the sample means will be more of the response will be more similar within each of the case stratum. Um, but the difference is a lot larger when we don't stratify. And that's why um, this bias, why the bias isn't lower than the non-stratified approach is because um, the, the non-stratified power prior approach, at least in this scenario, doesn't borrow as much historical data. And then we see um, a similar trend um, with um, when we look as, as we saw in the mixture prior as well. I know I might be going a little fast. Um, we can go back if there's questions here. Um, then once again, similar trend with scenario one and, um, on the first row and scenario two on the second row. Um, once again, we have um, our coverage is below its nominal level within all the weight approaches. And what we also notice um, in general, as our weight goes from um, the first, as we put more weight on the third stratum, um, our coverage actually improves. And that's what we see consistently throughout all three methods. Um, so the third stratum, and I, it's due to the sorting of the parentheses scores. Um, when we sort in the third stratum um, tends to have the, when we look at each stratum specific um, bias, we see that the third stratum tends to have smaller bias and better coverage of the true parameter of interest. And we see the similar, um, at least just summarizing here. Um, and once again, we do see um, improved coverage um, in scenario two, and the more variation in the response tends to um, increase more coverage uh, for the parameter of interest. Then last but not least, scenario three, um, this here we, here we, um, here we double the sample size um, from the first um, scenario. So now in our, before on our current group, we had a hundred observations and our external group, we had 1000 observations. Here we double the sample size of both. And what we notice in our hierarchical approach, um, we notice that bias um, is smaller using just the direct average. And this bias does tend to decrease as we put more and more weight on the um, middle stratum. Penalty is that our RMC is increasing as well. So going from non-stratified to more and more weight on the third stratum or the middle stratum. Similarly, once again, um, and in terms of when we double the sample size, we do notice our bias does decrease as a result. So, under, so when there's more, um, a larger sample size, um, we better estimate the parameter of interest. 
Then when we um, double synthesize, once again, we notice the same trend, the non-stratified approach, um, it's pretty close coverage to the nominal level of 95. Um, the stratified Bayesian frequency score approaches do, um, do have coverage below the nominal HPD level. And once again, when we look at the comparison between standard deviation and standard error, we see that standard deviation is consistently lower than the standard error. So um, to recap, um, so to recap our scenarios, um, what we notice is one, our hierarchical approach tends to have lower bias. Within all the approaches, as we put typically as we put more specifically in the hierarchical approach, but in general, we see as we put more and more weight on the third stratum, our bias um, tends to decrease. Our coverage tends to increase due to the fact that we're putting more and more weight on the third stratum. Um, and still, we notice that with all approaches that um, the undercoverage, um, we have an undercoverage, we observe undercoverage. And um, next steps, and that's what we'll discuss, is how to appropriately, how can we appropriately estimate this combined parameter of interest? So next steps, um, one, in our paper, we only um, presented only a few scenarios, and today we only presented a few scenarios. Um, here, we assume that once the covariates are matched, that um, once the covariates are matched, that our response are matched. Uh, additional scenarios to explore would be a time trend effect. So maybe the standard of care uh, changed from previous from an RWD to our current trial under, under investigation. So this can cause maybe an issue where the covariates are already uh, matched, but the responses might not be. Um, so how would our model adjust to that? And what can we do to um, take this case into account to also um, expand what kind and how much historical data we can borrow. Two, um, also explore scenarios where there's a misspecification mis propensity score model. Um, right, in our methods, we assume that the propensity score model is there's logistic regression and we assume it's correctly specified. Um, what happens if, say, um, we have a confounding variable in a propensity score model or um, we're missing a covariate in our propensity score model? Um, how, um, how, what can we do to it? How, can we, how does our method perform? And then also, what can we do to adjust that? Our main um, interest and our next step, um, that's what we've been working on, is determine appropriate variance estimation when combining the stratum specific estimates. And what can we do um, to fix this? Four, um, extend to a design setting. And then five, also what our next paper and current work is working on is extending this methodology to um, a randomized controlled trial. Um, so that's what our next steps will um, be. And there's already existing methods on this as well. So big takeaway messages are one, um, dividing conquer allows more intuitive handling of inconsistency of data and allows um, more broad types of external data to be borrowed. Yes, certain improvements um, has been observed and then um, such as bias and hierarchical approach um, and um, how much data we can actually borrow. And then three, additional research is needed for further improvement, especially with the underestimation of the variance of the combined parameter of interest. Um, yeah, with that, um, I can go back to slides as well, but with that, thank you everyone. Um, thank you, KOL, for organizing this. Thank you for having me and Gian. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we can open the floor to questions. Yeah, thank you, Eric, very much. Thank, thank you, Angie and Jude, for this great presentation. So if anybody has a question, we, you can unmute yourself and ask directly. I do see some question in the chat. If I don't hear from the audience, I will read the questions from the chat. Okay, the first one is from Pan Chen Xun. It asks, uh, since we are discussing rare diseases, the sample size for the trial part should be small, but at least not big. Uh, if we use PS-based stratification, the sample size for each subgroup will be further reduced. This may be a big concern of stratification. I'm more concerned about the sample size for trial part. I don't know if Jen and Eric. Maybe I can take on this uh, question, give a sure. step at it. I think, you know, um, this is actually a very relevant and a pragmatic question, right? Because I think at, at the end of the day, um, the appropriateness of, you know, implementing this framework depends on the disease area, right? And whether, uh, you know, you actually will be able to enroll a sufficient number of patients in the treatment arm or the current arm 
uh, as we mentioned in the uh, presentation. Right now, I think in our simulation setting, um, we present it, we consider that the treatment arm or the current arm, uh, sorry, not, not, not to uh, confuse uh, the audience, actually when I say the treatment, it refers to the current arm. Uh, they are all from the same treatment uh, regimen, right? So for the current arm, we consider a sample size of 100. So that we can actually, by dividing that into five strata, there are about 20 patients uh, you know, in each stratum. And if the sample size of this current arm gets smaller, for, and then the, it becomes a question, you know, the trade-off between the number of strata and then this total sample size, right? And also depends, depending on the number of patients available from the external data source, we also need to actually consider that um, how to prevent overborrowing from the external data source to kind of like uh, uh, completely influencing the whole uh, trial conclusions, right? So um, I would say if the sample size is smaller, if it's more difficult to actually enroll patients into the trial, then we may consider a smaller number of a stratum. And I think there is a related question later is like, how do we actually determine the number of a stratum, right? So is it based on uh, uh, just the, uh, you know, uh, the phi or the quintile approach? I think this is again, uh, the quintile approach is just for demonstration purposes, right? In reality, if you actually have a uh, smaller sample size in the current arm, you definitely want to actually consider a smaller number of strata. And ultimately, I think the determination for your uh, final cons uh, you know, analysis should be actually evaluated. Maybe, you know, um, what we would suggest is to conduct some simulation or evaluation and maybe determine the optimal or, you know, um, the, the, the most appropriate number of uh, strata uh, to, to, to begin with. But of course, if, um, you know, um, um, I think this is still remain, this still remains an open question is that if you want to model the number of strata as a parameter, right? And then incorporate in the Bayesian framework this, I think this can also be done, but um, at this moment, we haven't, uh, you know, uh, uh, conducted such evaluation yet. So hopefully this addresses the question. Yeah, both the Penchance question and the High House question. Uh, Erica, do you have anything else to add? Oh, um, I think Jane's answer is sufficient. Thank you. Great. Uh, so the next question is from Brad Carlin. So one confusion I have about the use of a pro propensity score in the one at our paper and apparently in this work too is which propensity is being computed in standard causal inference the score is the pr probability the individual would have received the active treatment but here, it is the probability the individual would have been a candidate for the current data set. So it is a tool for balancing covariates between data sets, but it doesn't have the same causal inference interpretation. Can you comment on this? Yeah, um, we also noticed this. Yeah, thank you for the question. We also noticed this as well. Um, this was, right, first introduced was in Wong et al. 2019. Yeah, they, they're introduced to Prince's score as probability of being in the current arm or not. So yes, it's um, not a direct, um, it's, not, it's, it's not the direct same interpretation as it was um, in, I think it was the Rosenbaum 1984 where they discussed about causal inference exactly. So yes, um, this is true. This, um, at least the parentheses score um, in our approach and their approach at least tries to at least define some similarity um, or some way to match both um, the historical data with the current data. Um, and, and I also want to maybe clarify, maybe it's also, you know, because, you know, we didn't make it very clear in the presentation is uh, really it's, um, we, when we are talking about the setting, it's actually about the same treatment regimen, right? So we are actually trying to borrow the information from the external data source, but it's not like we are comparing a treatment arm, control, uh, you know, versus a control arm, right? So the parameter in, of interest is not the treatment effect difference, right? So in, in, in our notation, it's not actually theta treatment minus theta control. It, it, it's actually we're trying to combine the theta external with the theta current. So 
Um, if the discrepancy across the data sources is caused by the baseline characteristics alone, the idea is that condition on, on the propensity score, the outcome distribution will be identical, right? Then there we can uh, basically kind of treat the patients as if they are from the same uh, data source, and then we can directly borrow that. Um, uh, the, 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 the only uh, tricky part here is that we also consider in the settings that if the discrepancy is caused by something else, not only by the baseline characteristics only, then uh, can even condition on, on the propensity score, the outcome distribution might still be slightly different. But we are still trying to estimate the same parameter, which is the theta, uh, the, the average treatment effect in the current arm. So mm -hmm. I hope you know uh, this clarifies the, the the motivation of using the propensity score. In the Thank setting. you. Yes, it does. Uh, I think I think Wang might recommend doing the same thing for the treatment group, right? If you were in a setting where it was treatment versus control, and you did happen to have historical both treateds and controls, I think they would recommend doing two separate propensity score matchings, right? One for each of the two groups. So, yeah, I think when it when it when it uh, goes to the um, uh, uh, a comparative setting, I think things will become more complicated because you know um, um, if it is a hybrid control, for example, then I think you know um, you, it's safe to assume that at least within the trial, the two uh, treatment arms, the, the 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 baseline characteristics are balanced, right? But the, still, there is a possibility, especially in smaller. Uh, uh, trials, even the two treatment arms um, may not be completely balanced. So then in that case, I agree that, you know, there could be uh, the potential need of doing two matching, you know, to kind of adjust the potential uh, discrepancy in the baseline characteristics. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question from Yoichiko. Uh, it says, what is the benefit of uh, this PS on um, propensity score stratified matching over standardized, a uh, standard propensity score matching. In other words, uh, in what situations we need to consider this uh, PS stratified matching? I can see Maljun responded to this question, but I do want to give a, a chance for the speakers to respond. Uh, maybe I can take a step first. I think, you know, th this is actually very, very interesting. Uh, and and, and um, I, and exactly at the beginning of this presentation, I wanted to actually uh, provide the motivations, right, for, for this framework. And I think um, to address both questions or the response as well, I think the, the um, you know, the most beneficial scenario or setting for this framework is that if you have a discrepancy and a cause the by um, factors that are actually not measured, for example, if you have unmeasured confounders, then relying on the propensity score matching or weighting or, uh, you know, all, all these methods will not be able to address that, right? And then there is another very pragmatic issue in, in, in practice is that although you can try all different kind of, of uh, propensity score model, right, there is always a chance of the misspecification of the propensity score model. And we actually, uh, uh, during our uh, research, we identified that even if you include the, all the relevant uh, covariates, there is still a chance that you, know, you actually should include all the interaction terms or, or, or you know, different kind of terms in, in addition to the linear predict predictors, right? So in, in this scenario, um, uh, uh, the, when the propensity score is actually calculated wrong right in this sense um there is still you know a, a chance that of uh, um, um, imbalanced covariates and more moreover i think um, uh, uh, right now when you try to borrow external data right you cannot ignore certain uh, operational issues especially the temporary effect you know uh, patients receiving the same treatment from you know nowadays they might be very different from the patients uh, five years ago, even if their baseline characteristics seem to match. And, and all of these issues actually cause certain, you know, um, limitation of the propensity score matching methods alone. So that's why we try to actually 
uh, combined. And I think one at all, they did this first, right? It's to kind of, you know, uh, do a hybrid approach, borrow the strength from both uh, framework, right? And you, you, to think it this way, right? If, if you try to use the Bayesian borrowing method and you have the individual patient level data and you're not fully utilizing the individual patient level, uh, you know, you, you actually ask the Bayesian dynamic borrowing to handle all the inconsistency on the overall level, right? It's not granular level. Why, why can't we just let the propensity score methods, you know, and uh, to handle some of the inconsistency that we know are caused by the imbalance of the baseline characteristics, right? And then let the Bayesian dynamic borrowing to take care of the rest. So from that angle, if you're a Bayesian, you really want to use that, but you, you can still utilize some of the uh, strengths from, from that, right? And if you, from the other side, if you just want to do the propensity score method, and like I said, there are a, a lot of issues that may still cause a limitation. Why can we, after this, you know, adjusting for the baseline characteristics, we can still ask, use the Bayesian method to handle, you know, additional uh, 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 inconsistency, right? Caused by other reasons. So I think this is really, well, and, and coming back to specific, why we use propensity score stratification, it's really for practical purpose because the consideration of stratification is it, it, it makes the Bayesian borrowing very easy, right? Because, you know, you, it's also very natural is that you, you, you have a set of patients and then you borrow within each stratum and then later on you group all, the, all, all, all of them together. So I think uh, um, maybe we didn't really make it very clear at the beginning. I, I thought I did, but I just wanted to clarify, you know, um, hopefully this can uh, highlight the, the needs and then, you know, uh, especially motivation of uh, using this type of a hybrid framework. Thank you very much for the clarification, Jen. So the next two questions are related. I'm just gonna read them together. One is from Tony says, are there any real examples, including rare diseases, where these methods are applied to? And one from Yihuai says, what are some used cases for this method? If the drug is not approved, can we get real world data for the drug? Uh, I, I think right now we would, um, we've seen some case study in, you know, in implementing RWD, right, in the, especially in the regulatory decision-making scenario. Um, but to our knowledge, I haven't seen the implementation of this framework in practice. We would certainly love to see, you know, um, and, and, and um, but like, like we mentioned during the presentation, I think uh, we also need to be cautious because there are still uh, certain issues remaining to be uh, improved. And I would recommend that before implementing this method, uh, extensive simulation studies need to be actually uh, conducted to fully understand its performance. And then more importantly is, you know, um, to obtain a robust and reliable uh, conclusion. And yeah, that's that, you know, I, I, I think with, uh, 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 more and more awareness, you know, we will, um, I, and I, I pretty much, you know, look forward to seeing a real case. We too really want to see some real case uh, for using yeah. statistics in the whole. And there's another question, I believe you already touched base on. Uh, it's uh, uh, so from Yihua says, in your method of propensity score, or for current and external have the same set of covariates? What if the external data have a smaller set of covariates or different quantity data for the same covariate if the external data is from um, electronic health record? Yeah, I, I think we would love to see that in the case that we have the necessary information for us to build a more, you know, uh, a more robust PS model, right, propensity score model. But if in that case, Again, I think it's the trade-off. Uh, and however, this framework at least offers a, a, a pathway to kind of incorporate that setting, right? You use basically the available covariates to build the propensity score. But in this case, you know some of the important prognosis factors may be missing. 
And then um, in the Bayesian dynamic borrowing part, then we have to be very careful about, you know, to control the amount of information to, to be borrowed within each strata. I think it's still doable. It's still, you know, you can still implement this framework and, and it's just the um, uh, uh, waiting, you know, coming to the borrowing part, it's going to be more, um, uh, requires more evaluation. And again, I would, you know, recommend that uh, you, uh, to conduct some simulation. And it, especially if you have some assumption about, you know, how the missing covariates, right, may actually influence the outcome. And then taking all the, uh, you know, evaluation into consideration uh, for the ultimate analysis. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. I want to give the audience another chance to bring up any questions before we conclude the session. I don't see anything, then I will stop recording. And uh, thank you very much for <laughs> uh, having this presentation and um, uh, everybody. And joining this meeting, and I uh, would like to wish everybody a great weekend. Thank you very much, Frida. Thank, Thank you. you.